paint, spin, 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 and and waiting for confirmation that we are recording. Doodly doodly, the little spinny thing is spinning and spinning. And um, and these three guys walk into a bar. You'd think the third one would have ducked. Uh, so let's go back to uh, where we were. All right. Can everybody see? Um, can everybody see that? Okay, somebody says yes. Okay, right. Okay, so there we go. We've talked about anthozoa, sea anemones and corals. Uh, we've talked about scyphozoa, uh, that's most jellyfish, box jellies in the cubozoa. The hydrozoa is the last major group. And hydrozoans also, most of them, have a medusa stage. Uh, often, you can find exceptions, but often the medusa stage is small. Uh, the medusa may only be a few millimeters in size, although there are some larger hydromedusae. Uh, usually the polyp is very small, maybe a millimeter. Uh, usually the polyps have a sheath uh, surrounding them called the periderm. Uh, which is made of this chitin-like material. Uh, there are some polyps that don't have this. And um, very many of them, when they're in the polyp stage, the polyps form a colony. Uh, a little bit like, superficially, what we saw for some of the colonial anthozoans, like the soft corals. Um, scyphozoan polyps and cubozoan polyps are never colonial. Uh, but the polyps of hydrozoa may form colonies that can actually get fairly large, even though each individual polyp is tiny. Uh, finally, the medusa often has a ring-shaped membrane around the aperture of the bell uh, called a velum. So let's see what these look like. Uh, there's a typical colonial hydrozoan. Uh, in this particular group, the periderm, uh, that's that chitin-like outer layer, uh, not only covers the uh, common stems and branches, uh, but it covers most of the polyp as well, and it forms these structures that look kind of like wine glasses, uh, called hydrophicae. Uh, the polyp can retract into each hydrophica uh, or can extend its tentacles out. And you've got specialization uh, because the feeding polyps are called gastrozoids, you know, stomach animals. But there are also polyps that don't feed and that are specialized for budding off uh, little medusae, and these are called gonozoids. So in the middle of that drawing, you've got this larger thing uh, with a kind of stem in it, and off of that stem are budding off uh, little medusas that go swimming away. Uh, that's a gonozoid. And then the gastrozoids don't butt off medusae. Uh, and they're specialized for feeding. And all of these zoids are connected. They've all got, uh, you know, digestive cavities uh, that all empty into each other. So, you know, some can feed and pass on some of that food to uh, the gonozoids. Uh, that specialize in butting off the medusae. Uh, these are pretty common in marine habitats. This is a hydrozoan colony uh, where I'd say each of those branches that look like feathers might be a couple of centimeters long. Uh, this is genus Aglophenia. Uh, there's some little lumps you can see that are clusters of reproductive zoids um, colonies like this are informally known as hydroids, although that's not a formal biological taxon, uh, and they can get fairly big. You may have seen hydra, genus hydra, 
in biology classes before. By the standards of the hydrozoa, it's actually quite weird uh, because first of all, it lives in fresh water, uh, not the ocean. It doesn't have that chitinous sheath. It is uh, not colonial and it's lost its Medusa stage. So you may have seen this one in previous classes, but by the standards of most hydrozoans, it's actually quite aberrant. Um, it uh, does not behave like a properly, um, you know, well, uh, you know, well-behaved hydrozoan should. Uh, in fact, there's one group of hydrozoans that form these colonies uh, that actually have a lot of calcium carbonate uh, in them. So they're kind of convergent on anthozoan corals. Uh, the common name for these is fire corals because of what it feels like when you brush up against one. And then the medusas tend to be um, relatively small. They're not usually as prominent as some of those giant jellyfish that we saw in a previous lecture. Uh, the mouth actually kind of hangs down from the inside of the bell on an extension called a manubrium. Uh, manubrium happens to be Latin for uh, the grip of a sword. So if you imagine a sword with kind of a bell-shaped handguard, uh, like, a, like a fencing epée, and uh, the grip kind of hanging down in the middle of that bell-shaped guard, uh, that would be the manubrium. Um, the um, stomach often extends into a series of radial canals uh, that kind of branch out. Um, there's typically eight of them, and they all connect into a ring canal that goes around the edge of the bell. Thank you. Uh, you see this really well in this Antarctic hydromedusa. Um, it's kind of hard for me to see on my screen, but the, um, uh, the epidermis is transparent. The gastrodermis is red. And you can see branching out from the center, you have eight bright red radial canals that connect into a bright red uh, ring canal uh, that goes around the edge of the bell. And then extending inwards from that, you have a vela, uh, the sheet of tissue that looks kind of crumpled in this particular view. Uh, each radial canal has this orange thing that's hanging down. Uh, that's a gonad. Uh, remember, this is the sexual stage of the life cycle. So this one actually makes it easy to grasp the anatomy because it's color-coded. Again, great majority of hydrozoans are marine. In freshwater, we have hydra, uh, which I have seen in pond water around here. We might try to get some next week. Uh, I mentioned that there is one freshwater hydrozoan that does have a medusa stage, and in your playlist, I'll include some footage of them. Uh, this is the freshwater jellyfish, and as I've mentioned, we do sometimes find these in uh, lakes in Arkansas. And there's another one that's important for those of you interested in biotech. Uh, this is the medusa of the hydrozoan Echoria victoria, uh, which actually has a lot of radial canals, uh, not just eight. Uh, that's what you're seeing here, uh, where you have this kind of disc-shaped stomach and um, uh, bioluminescent spots around the rim. Um, those bioluminescent spots around the rim are bioluminescent because they contain a protein called green fluorescent protein, or GFP. Uh, that gene's been cloned, and it's so heavily used in molecular genetics experiments that the science who worked this out uh, won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 2008. What's so great about this is that you can take the gene for GFP and you can stick it on the end of another gene, any other gene, and then you can try to insert that other gene into um, whatever cells you want to. And if the gene insertion works and the sequence is functional, then the cells that have been transformed uh, will fluoresce green. 
so you can test whether you have successfully been able to insert a bit of foreign DNA into a cell. You can tell whether your genetic engineering worked. That's why this is important, and you'll see a lot of references to GFP in, um, in the literature. Uh, these are uh, some naked mice uh, that come from a line that had the Equoria GFP gene inserted. And in daylight, I don't think they look all that different. Uh, but in uh, under UV, I think, uh, they actually do, in fact, fluoresce green. Uh, and you can see three of them fluorescing green, and then there's one that isn't. Uh, that's a control that hasn't had Equoria inserted, uh, the GFP gene inserted. And then Wendy, I think, was telling me she's actually got these. Uh, these are glowfish. Uh, that's a freshwater zebrafish. Uh, up at the top is a wild-type uh, zebrafish, uh, Danny O'Rario, uh, which you can find in just about any pet shop that's got an aquarium department. And in the early 2000s, this originally started as an attempt to develop fish that would fluoresce in the presence of pollutants uh, so you could use them to test for the presence of uh, polluting compounds in fresh water. But it turned out that when you inserted GFP, they fluoresced all the time. And these were the first genetically engineered animals to be sold as pets. So the first to go on the market would fluoresce green under the right uh, aquarium light, one that put out some UV. More recently, they've done this in more species. There's at least three and maybe more by now different species of popular aquarium fish that fluoresce. And they found other bioluminescent genes uh, in other cnidarians that fluoresce in different colors. Uh, so you can now get fish that fluoresce in red, gold, and purple. Uh, as well as the um, as well as the original green, and I think Wendy was telling me she's actually got a couple of these in her tank. Uh, you can certainly see them at PetSmart. Um, I think most pet stores that have a decent aquarium department will have at least some glowfish. Um, yeah, the first genetically engineered pets ever sold on the market. And all ultimately stemming from this research into molecular engineering using GFP from Equoria as a marker. So yet another reason to know your invertebrate zoology. There's cool stuff to be found that can sometimes help with some very basic research problems and also create freaky glowing fish. Right. Oh, this is really cool. Um, they isolated mutants of the original green fluorescent protein that uh, glowed red and blue as well as the original green. And there's a technique you can use for tagging neurons with mixtures of red, green, and blue. And you can do it in such a way that every neuron gets a random mix of red, green, and blue, which means that every neuron fluoresces a slightly different color. And here you can see the result. This is a slice through some mouse cortex uh, where every cell is fluorescing a slightly different color. Every different cell has a slightly different mix of red, green, and blue. Uh, the end result looks like something that I saw at that Grateful Dead show in the Oakland Coliseum back in 1992. Uh, but it also is very good for tracing neural connections because every cell is a slightly different color. Uh, so this is called a brain bow. And it's not only beautiful, but it's um, a tool for tracing uh, very complex neural connections by, by color. So that's yet more fun things you can do with a hydrozoan uh, fluorescent protein. There's an even weirder trick uh, that the hydrozoan Turritopsis nutricula has developed. This is the medusa. Uh, you can see the manubrium hanging down. And then that orange stuff in the middle, that's the gonads uh, sitting right on the stomach, just right on top of the manubrium. 
this would sexually reproduce and then hydrozoan jellies usually die after sexual reproduction. Uh, but turritopsis can transdifferentiate, which means its cells can just turn back into a polyp. This is the so-called immortal jellyfish. I mean, not that you can't kill it, and we don't really know how many cycles it could possibly go through, uh, but it can take one type of differentiated cell and turn it into a second type of differentiated cell. That's transdifferentiation. In every other animal known, you have stem cells that differentiate into mature cell types, right? The fertilized egg that you came from uh, divided and divided and divided, and eventually those cells started differentiating into skin cells or brain cells or muscle cells or whatever it was. Uh, some of your organs retain populations of stem cells. We now know there are stem cells in your brain that can differentiate into new nerve cells if necessary. Uh, and they can actually do that. And in the lab, it's possible to take mature cells to revert to stem cells. We call these iPSCs, induced pluripotent stem cells. So in theory, we could come up with a way to get, you know, some of your cells to revert back to stem cells and then differentiate into new cells and maybe repair some types of organ damage that way. But somehow turritopsis has worked out a way for mature cells to differentiate into new mature cells and not go back to being stem cells. Really neat trick. Working that out might open up new ways of repairing damaged organs or something like that. Uh, that's attracting a lot of attention for applications in regenerative medicine and anti-aging therapy. Uh, on the other hand, turritopsis is a very widespread and in introduced uh, an invasive species. Uh, what it might do to marine ecosystems, I don't think we really know. Uh, that one is one looking up the bell. Uh, you can see the velum, uh, that ring-shaped membrane that surrounds the opening to the bell. Um, you can see the orange gonads right there. Uh, and then close by each one of the gonads, you can see one of the radial canals. In this species, there are four. Okay, last thing about hydrozoa is that, as I mentioned before, in a colony of hydrozoans, different polyps will specialize for different functions. Uh, some will feed, some will reproduce, and so on. The polyps in a colony are known as zoids, and that's another word you're going to see um, for you know an individual that's become a specialized unit within a colonial organism. Uh, there's other critters that have zoids. And in some cases, the polyps may become so integrated that they essentially turn into a new individual made up of uh, multiple specialized zoids. So in lab, you're going to see this. And in fact, you could look at the prepared slide in advance if you feel like it, if you get bored. Uh, this is genus Obelia. Uh, this is a fairly typical hydrozoan. Um, at the left, that arrow is pointing to a gastrozoid. Uh, that's just a feeding polyp with tentacles. Uh, if you look carefully, you can see that the uh, polyp is actually surrounded by this kind of wine glass looking uh, translucent uh, uh, cover of uh, periderm. Uh, that's typical. And they, of course, have the tentacles. They've got the stinging cells. They do the feeding and all that. And then there's a gonozoid uh, over at the right, and that doesn't have tentacles. It doesn't feed. Uh, the kind of lumpy red thing that you see in the middle is the stem of the gonozoid in the process of budding off new medusae. Uh, each one of those little lumps is eventually going to become a new medusa uh, that will push its way out of an opening in the top of the gonozoid and go off and swim and be free. This is another hydrozoan. It's called Porpita. 
And all of that blue stuff that you're seeing is colonies of polyps. And the colonies of polyps collectively secrete out of their periderm uh, this chitinous uh, float in the middle. Uh, that brown thing that you're seeing that has all those uh, very regular uh, lines radiating from the middle is made of chitin and it's hollow. It's in fact divided up into chambers and it's filled with gas. Uh, so Porpita is planktonic. It floats. It uses that gas-filled float like a pool floaty and hanging down from that float, you have these chains of feeding polyps and also of gonozoids uh, that bud off tiny medusas. Um, the medusas aren't very well known because they're so small and because Porpita normally floats out in the open ocean, uh, it's not that easy to find. Uh, although, uh, when I was a little kid, we went to Fort Walton Beach, Florida for a family vacation. And I actually saw one of these washed up on the beach. And at the time, I didn't know what it was. It was years before I realized what I must have been poking at. Um, but yeah, when they're washed up on the beach, you know, they may be dying or dead and they may not be that easy to study. So we don't know that much about the life of, uh, of poor Peta. Um, but these things that are hanging down look like jellyfish tentacles, but they're not. This is not a jellyfish. This is a polyp colony, uh, and it buds off tiny medusas. And then the most extreme example are hydrozoans in a group called the siphonophora. Uh, and these are very diverse in the deep sea. Uh, up at the top of the picture, you can't really see what it is, but there is a gas-filled zoid. It's a polyp that's specialized to secrete a gas bubble. It's called a pneumatophore. Extending downwards from that, you have a chain of 20 zoids that are specialized for swimming. They're called nectophores. Uh, they're basically medusae that have never butted off and left. Uh, they're just kind of stuck there. Uh, all of them pulsing together to enable the colony to swim. And then trailing off behind it, down and to the left, you have this long chain of gastrozoids, feeding uh, polyps, and gonozoids that reproduce. Uh, and these happen to be bioluminescent. Uh, that's why they look bright, and they're thought to act as a lure for small fish. So you've got at least four different types of uh, zoid, each of which does something different. One helps float, some propel, um, some do the feeding, and some do the reproduction. And the whole thing is integrated into one unit that behaves almost like it was a single animal. Uh, there's a close-up of a related one. You can see the bioluminescent pneumatophore and some of those swimming nectophores all connected by a stem. Uh, just in April, uh, there was a research team exploring some ocean canyons off Western Australia uh, using a remotely operated vehicle, uh, much, much safer than you know, sending people down there, although we do have some human operated uh, submersibles that can go down there. And uh, down several thousand feet down a deep sea canyon, uh, they spotted a siphonophore called Apollinia uh, coiled into this shape and estimated to extend 150 feet. Uh, there's actually some footage of it uh, that I'll post to the playlist. Um, I'll try to remember to, uh, to do that. What you have to know about the deep ocean is there's no productivity. There's no algae or anything because there's no light. The, aside from a few specialized ecosystems around uh, volcanic hydrothermal vents, the only source of fixed carbon is dead things raining down from above. And that means that there's just not a lot of energy available to things that live in the deep sea. So most deep sea critters swim very slowly. Uh, there's just not enough food to sustain fast attack predators, uh, something like tuna or something like that. There's just not enough for predators like that down that deep. 
And a lot of predators are very slow. They'll just sit and wait. Uh, or in the case of siphonophores like this, they're basically just, you know, living drift nets. Um, they'll just consume as little metabolic energy as possible and just sit there and wait for something to drift into the net. And so they'll grow into these extremely long, um, you know, drifting, trailing, almost drift net like uh, shapes. That's a way of making a living as a predator in a world where it may be a very long time between prey encounters. Uh, you just you do this very low energy life cycle, lifestyle, low energy lifestyle, and just sit and wait for something to hit. And while you're waiting, you burn as few calories as possible. And there's other critters that we'll see that have that kind of lifestyle. It's an adaptive one in that deep sea, low energy type environment. The best known siphonophore uh, actually lives up at the surface though. And this is one that sometimes washes up on the beach and it only has vestigial nectophores. Uh, it can't swim on its own. On the other hand, it's got a gas filled pneumatophore, a gas filled zoid uh, that's very large. Uh, this is the so-called Portuguese man of war. Um, man of war in this case refers to a warship. Hi there. How's it going? Hi. Hi. Uh, the plumber's just arrived. Looks like a very nice person. Going to fix some problems that we're having. Um, anyway, uh, that pneumatophore up there at the top is filled with gas, and these float and trailing down like a giant net, you can see these very long tentacles. They're not technically tentacles. What those are is zoids. Uh, you've got some very, very long feeding gastrozoids. Uh, you've got defensive zoids called dactylozoids, and you've also got gonozoids as well. Uh, these are potentially dangerous to humans because unlike those weird deep sea things, these very uh, often will wash up on beaches because they float. Uh, they can sometimes wash up on beaches in swarms. The sting hurts like hell, and it depends on just how great a length of tentacle you come into contact with. Uh, but if you get stung by a lot of nematocysts, uh, like if you get stung by a lot of these tentacles, um, they have killed people in the past. They are capable of causing fatalities. Although, you know, the dose is everything. Uh, there's a whole swarm of a related species uh, that washes up in Australia. Uh, Physalia utriculus is affectionately known as the blue bottle. Uh, about 10,000 people get stung every year. Although you kind of have to be unlucky to be killed because you have to come into contact with lots of tentacle. And so you have these finger-like gastrozoids and then long trailing dactylozoids for predation and defense. And then the fine gonozoids look like little bunches of grapes and each one of the grapes is a permanently tethered medusa uh, that's lost all of its structures except for its gonads. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing there and I'm gonna give you folks uh, 20 minutes uh, because I, um, uh, I need to help my wife out and uh, help talk to the plumber. Uh, so I've got 1022. Go ahead and come back at 1045, and I'll stop recording.